Welcome back, everybody. I'm uh, here with uh, Eric James Stone. Uh, right now, we're going to talk again about the uh, Russia-Ukraine conflict. It is February 25th. I, I have to actually say that now because every time these episodes air, uh, you know what we discuss and project often becomes history by the time that these things are presented. So. What I'm going to do is just give a rundown of where, you know, where we are. So as of, uh, you know, uh, last night, last night being, you know, um, uh, in the U.S. last night, it was, you know, during the day, uh, the Russians had, you know, begun entering Kiev and, and, and fighting in Kiev. Um, President Zelensky had authorized uh, the dis- distribution of 10,000 rifles to the population, as well as, you know, urge them to, you know, use Molotov cocktails and things like that in resisting the Russian invaders. Uh, the, the main force on the Russian side apparently had come from the north to the, to the uh, uh, from Belarus and from Russia in a uh, pincer movement, uh, you know, one to avoid a river crossing on the right, you know, the 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 right side, or the uh, east, the western banks of the Dnieper or the Dnieper River, and then you know again the, the forces advancing from the uh, Russian side were on the eastern um, banks. Uh, we also there were also reports of uh, you know paratroopers you know coming in and seizing several airfields, kind of dropping it. I believe from from um, helicopters, but the prior day, there were there was video on social media of uh, paratroopers dropping out of a Lucian seventy six military aircraft. Um, the the Russians, in a an extremely reckless and um, dangerous operation, had seized the Chernobyl exclusionary zone in the north, and by you know the media reports are that they're holding the uh, folks who were watching over, supervising the plant hostage. Um, so that's, uh, and then there's the kind of the, the the story of Snake Island, right? Where, um, you know, there were 13 folks who were or soldiers on that island who were, you know, asked to surrender and they promptly told the Russians to uh, you know, worship, go F yourself. So, um, and then, you know, apparently they were, you know, all subsequently killed. So there's a, there's, there's a lot going on. There's also the roads are all jammed up as Ukrainians are, are fleeing Kiev. So with that, um, Eric and I are going to kind of discuss what's next. And, and, and Eric, can you tell the audience what, what's relevant about your background that uh, you know, gives you some unique insight that, that I, I certainly don't have because I I've never been, you know, to that, to, to Russia or Ukraine. So, you know, what, what in your background kind of um, gives you some insight? Yeah. Um, back, back when I was in college, I was a political science major. Um, and uh, one of the, you know, uh, one of the things I decided to study was Russian. I, I took a year of Russian um, this was back during the, the Cold War, um, and uh, you know I felt like you know if I was you know I might want to work for the CIA or the State Department or something like that, and so so having some some Russian knowledge would uh, be helpful. Uh, unfortunately, when I hit Russian two hundred one, uh, mm-hmm. I decided maybe minoring in Russian was not going to be the the, the best thing, but I. Um, I, I, I still sang in the Russian choir for, for two years. Um, and uh, then, uh, you know, I, because of when, that, when, I, when you said you sang in the Russian choir, what does that, what does that mean? Oh yeah. B, BYU ha, had, a, and for all I know, still has a Russian choir where we would sing Russian folk songs and um, uh, sometimes the Soviet national anthem, uh, <laughs> which uh, at a conservative school like BYU, it was kind of, kind of funny to to do. Uh, but um, but yeah, so uh, I I did develop a 
you know, a love for the, the, the Russian people at that, that time. Um, and uh, I, so when, you know, Berlin Wall came down and the Soviet Union broke up, I, I really had high hopes for Russian people once they were freed from, from tyranny. Um, but unfortunately, the way things went with, with Putin, um, they just ended up with a different uh, brand of tyranny. Um, but I, I've, I've maintained my love for the, the, the Russians and, and the other former Soviets, uh, you know, beyond that. And so um, I've often incorporated Russian themes into my work. Uh, my novel, Unforgettable, which came out from Bain, uh, one of the major characters is a former Russian spy. Um, and, uh, you know, so, um, and uh, while I was writing that novel, uh, I uh, had a scene set in a Russian nightclub. And so I started listening to Russian techno music. And now half my music collection is, is Russian music. Um, Have you ever seen that? There's a website that you can actually listen to radio stations in different cities by just like clicking on I, it. I have seen that. Yes. So. Uh, I, I can't, I wish I could recall what that site was because I'm right now writing a novel where I needed to know what, like what the closest radio station was to a place in the Russian far East. And I discovered it. Now I can't remember what it is, <laughs> but uh, actually no, I guess it's in my, it's in my outline. So I can always figure that out, but sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. It just kind of, reminded me of that in terms of doing research for writers yeah so um you know i i i'm not i don't currently work in politics uh but i am still a political junkie so i read a lot of stuff um and so uh i can't claim to be an expert on russia and the ukraine but i've i've read quite a bit about it um and uh, I, I have some thoughts, particularly on the, the diplomatic uh, angle, uh, as opposed to the military angle. So let's actually talk about that. So given the state of what, you know, where things are based on the summary I gave at the beginning, like, what do you think the diplomatic end state is for the, on the Russian side for this? Yeah. Well, I mean, obviously, the the Ukrainian military is not going to be able to stand up to the Russians in the long term. Uh, now, the question of whether they, uh, you know, continue fighting a, you know, an insurgent war against the Russian forces for a long time, like the Afghans did uh, against Russia and then against us, you know, uh, that's you know that's still to be seen. But the, the Russians are almost certainly going to be able to achieve any, you know, major military goals that they, they, they have. Um, uh, the, the, Russian, one of the Russian foreign minister did kind of float the idea of Ukraine um, being a non-aligned country and the Ukrainians have kind of floated that idea as well. That's what they call um, Finlandization, right? Yes, yeah, and uh, you know, of course, Finland uh, may join NATO, but uh, as a result of this, but um, uh, and, and know, if, they, think, if they, I mean, and if they're not thinking about it now, they they seriously should. Oh yeah, there there are there are left wing members of the Finnish Parliament who are now supporting joining NATO, uh, which is uh, along with Sweden, um, which is uh, a, a major shift. Well, let's actually let's let's tease that out a little bit, too, because what what people don't realize is the next target. So when I talk to folks who are in the U.S., at least the military establishment, you know, even in December, it wasn't a question of when or sorry, it wasn't a question of if. Right. Putin would invade Ukraine. They just looking at the armaments and the way he was positioning forces. It was obvious to all of us that was going to happen. Right. And if you don't believe me, like, you know, I've look at the my video with Sean McFate and, you know, no, no, I've uh, I've been reading you on Facebook and stuff like that and and other things. And I 
I I was hoping it wouldn't come to this, but I was pretty sure he was going to, that Putin was going to invade. So what what most, you know, not most, but what many in the military establishment were looking at was, you know, not not where. And again, I shouldn't say many because I'm not really, you know, LinkedIn is, you know, I've been I've been out of it for for 20 years, but the sentiment seems to be that. It's not, you know, it wasn't if he was going to inv- invade Ukraine, but what he was going to do next after Ukraine. And there was a lot of discussion around the Baltics and things like that. And this is a realization that I personally came to in like the last 24 to 48 hours, which is Putin is bold, but he's not stupid. And I think that while it might be tantalizing to grab the three Baltics, three Baltic states, which are NATO members, Right. Um, in order to to to, to um, you know establish a land bridge to Kaliningrad, right, which is that enclave, Russian enclave that uh, you know has access to the Black Sea, but there's no land bridge there. That he might go after those those countries to to establish that. And then it occurred to me that it, Finland is not a member of NATO, and Finland effectively establishes the same thing it gives it gives russia um you know more access to the the baltic sea so you know and there's also a historical relationship with russia and finland i.e russia used to to own it or own right. portions of it right so i would not be surprised if in a year, you know, a year from now, maybe not not as soon, that Putin started agitating there, right? Be it sending little green men to, uh, you know, cause some, you know, di- dispute over access to you know, resources and things like that with you know Russian villagers on the border. But you know, again, I don't know very much about what's there and who lives out on the border, but. I can see that as being potentially the next target. So anyway, I, I didn't mean to interrupt. You're, you're kind of going through the diplomatic end state and what the Russians were floating. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it'll, be, it'll be interesting to see whether, um, particularly if Russian forces do get bogged down a bit, whether... Uh, it, you know, having Ukraine say, okay, we will be non-aligned, we will not join NATO, et cetera, is, might be enough for Putin to withdraw and say he's achieved his objectives, you know, by keeping Ukraine as a buffer. Uh, although the, you know, the, what his, what his big speech pitched it as was basically you know, Ukraine has always been part of Russia. And so I, I'm not sure how, you know, he'll be able to spin it as, a, you know, anything less than complete control of Ukraine as, as being a, a total victory. But um, so the, the question then becomes uh, the reaction of the West uh, and sanctions and things like that. I'm, I'm kind of disappointed that Germany and Italy are balking at cutting Russia out of the SWIFT uh, financial network, um, which would really hamper their their ability to, to move funds around. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I mean, the, the, the Russian stock market lost, you know, a third of its value. Um, and, you know, a lot of these billionaires, they're you know, their net worth has gone down a bunch. Their assets are going to be frozen outside of Russia and things like that. Well, my, my understanding is that, that well, again, I, I shouldn't say my understanding. I got this from the media, so there's a 50% chance it's not true. Um, the My understanding is, is that Putin floated the, you know, what, what he was going to do to, to the oligarchs about four months ago. So they had time to 
you know, do some money laundering and, you know, get things on different continents and things like that. So even freezing assets might not necessarily be super effective. Yeah, uh, interesting. I, ha I had not heard that. Um, but, uh, you know, essentially, the, the sanctions that have been imposed so far, um, Putin probably thinks he can weather them. Um, uh, cut, uh, basically, short of getting an embargo on um, Russian exports of oil and uh, natural gas, um, what we're doing is not going to severely hurt uh, the Russian economy. In fact, the fact uh, the spiking oil prices actually helps the Russian economy. Um, so, and I think as of last night, Brent crude, the international uh, oil st standard for you know the dollar per price of oil barrel in barrels was I think a, a, a hundred and one seventy five seventy eight something like that. So it's it's already crossed the hundred dollar threshold. Yeah. yeah uh, um, so, yeah, unfortunately, the I think too many. Too many Western countries have economies that are entangled enough with the Russian economies and the energy supplies. I mean, we import a bunch of oil from Russia, you know, uh, and uh, I, I think that uh, too too many countries are maybe willing to say, "Well, we we can't damage our own economies too much to get at the Russians." And so I, I, I'm concerned the Russians may actually manage to weather the economic crisis, and then people will say, "Well, it's a, uh, you know, it's a done deal. The Russians have Ukraine, um, you know, and we'll go back to normal." That's kind of mostly what happened after. Uh, Russia, you know, invaded Georgia and Russia took Crimea. And yeah, it's, uh, I, I think that's, uh, uh, you know, unless, unless the West steps up with really tough sanctions against, uh, and that by that I mean oil embargo, uh, I think it's quite possible Putin will end up getting away with it. Unless there's enough resistance back home in Russia to what he's doing. And I, I have to admire the bravery of people who are protesting in, in Russia right now. Yeah, um, it's not like here where you can burn a city down and nothing happens to yeah, you. Yeah, um, right? it's, uh, you know, they, they are, you know, risking, uh, you know, imprisonment or, or possibly even death by protesting against Putin's uh, war. Um, and, you know, I, you know, I, I, uh, but unless there's a, a critical mass of people, they're willing to, to risk that uh, in order to sh shut down Putin's government from within, um, I, I'm afraid that's not going to be enough to stop it. I hate to be kind of a pessimist on this. Uh, you know, if if I were, if I were in, you know, if I were president, <laughs> um, I I would uh, actually favor a policy of uh, we cut off all trade with Russia and with any country that refuses to join our embargo with Russia. If China refuses to join our embargo with Russia, we cut off all trade with China. Um, you know, and basically, everyone can choose whether they would rather trade with the United States or with Russia. Um, and I think, uh, you know, that might be uh, enough to get a, a, an oil you know, embargo on Russia. And uh, but, yeah, it uh, our options are limited if we're not going to actually get our troops involved. And I. You know, I, I don't see any way that we're going to actually 
go into Ukraine with troops uh, to fight against the Russians. Uh, you know, we did proxy wars in Korea and Vietnam, but I don't think we're up for doing that in Ukraine. Well, you, you do you do know that in February 2018, in one night, we killed more Russian speakers than in any single night of the Cold War, right? Uh, that was in uh, Syria, right? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I... I uh, not, not, not to say that we should, you know, I'm not saying we should go in. I'm just saying, you know, the capabilities are still relatively lopsided if yeah. we chose to get involved. Yeah, it's just, uh, I, you know, having, having just ended the, the war in Afghanistan, I don't know how much appetite there is for another war. Um, and so, yeah, I... And frankly, I, yeah, it, it's it's one of those things where, uh, you know, if if Ukraine had been a member of NATO, I would fully support troops going in, um, and I would fully support troops going in uh, for any of our our NATO allies. The uh, the, the the but the fact is they aren't and do we want to get the u.s military involved in a war when they were not you know that when we do not have treaty obligations to get involved um i but i i think we may need to make clear to putin that if he does invade the baltic states for instance uh that that we will absolutely uh, get involved. So, yeah, I think, and this is a broader issue. Nobody in the media is really talking about it because, you know, they're they don't do their homework. They're lazy and they have a particular narrative. Um, but my other big concern is the precedent all this sets. So, and. You know, the Ukrainians gave up their nuclear weapons as part of the non Luger program. Um, and what's the ultimate result? Like Russia signed a treaty saying that if they gave up their nuclear weapons, they, you know, they won't, you know, they won't attack. Right. Yeah. That treaty obviously meant nothing. Uh, I've, I've, I've heard, but I haven't looked firsthand at the treaty, but I've heard that the U.S., um, in that in that treaty, there was some vow of defense if they gave up that. Now, again, I haven't researched it and I haven't gone into any detail, but there was some provision that may have implied something like that. Yeah. So they got rid of their nuclear weapons and they got they got you know they got invaded. Same can be said for Libya. They got rid of their chemical weapons because we scared the crap out of them when we invaded Iraq and what happened to Gaddafi gone right I'm not saying he doesn't deserve to be gone but the precedent that that set sets is if you're North Korea there's not a chance in hell you're going to give up nuclear weapons if you're Iran you are accelerating your development of nuclear weapons hell if you're South Korea like I'm looking over my shoulder right now is the U.S. really have my back Japan, does the U.S. really have my back? Europe, Poland, does the U.S. really have my back? So I'm not saying that we get involved full scale, but we got to do something. Yeah. Especially when the, when the guy threatens us directly with nuclear weapons. This is the time that we start. We're not. So on my call with Sean McFade, he wrote, wrote a book called The New Rules of War. He talked about how we're very good at these traditional World War II, like we're still able to fight World War II really, really well, but we don't do gray zone warfare. I think now's the time to test it out a little bit. Like, you're going to threaten us, Putin? Okay. Like, you know, uh, those, those, those Polish partisans, we have nothing to do with them. That cyber attack by Anonymous, I don't know where that happened. It's time to start playing the gray zone angle. 
and start to kind of experiment and, and push him. Because the last time a dictator came in and you know claimed that ethnic an ethnic minority was being persecuted was the Sudetenland. Yep. Right. And we know where that led. So I'm not saying that we get fully involved, but we 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 need to punch this guy in the mouth just so he understands that we just spent 20 years fighting wars. And, you know, and that was with an, an enemy that's hiding in the shadows. It's easy to locate Russian tanks. Right. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I uh, again, you have to be careful. You have to be surgical. But I think we need to start playing their game to make it clear that you don't get away with this, this kind of thing. And right now he is, we're not yeah. doing it. Like these sanctions are completely fangless. Like they're not, not gonna, uh, you know, I, you know, I'm characterizing what you said, but um, you know, and I'm hyperbolizing it a bit. Right. But, but basically if I were to summarize your characterization of these sanctions, they're, 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 they're going to be ineffective. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I kind of, kind of makes me uh, wish for a psychic assassin that could take out Putin. <laughs> well, yeah, that, well, that's the other thing too. Like once you, once you, well, we, I mean, maybe not psychic assassins, but there are people who, you know, um, that can always be, I mean, Putin does it himself with Novichok and uh, Dioxin and, you know, he's, he's the assassin's assassin. Right. But once you open that, once you open that kimono, you can never close it. Yeah. So with that, I guess I think we're right on the hour. So yeah. any, any, any other, any other comments that you wanted to get in? Cause we didn't really get too deep into the dip diplomatic solution for my uh, rant. Uh, yeah. No, I, I, I just want to agree with, uh, with you on, you know, I kind of thought when we, you know, uh, with the, the first Gulf War, when we, you know, uh, got uh, Iraq out of Kuwait, that we were, you know, finally establishing the president, you don't invade another country to take over its territory. That's right. um, and uh, unfortunately, we have allowed the Russians to infringe on that with Georgia and Crimea and, you know, they, they've gotten away with it. And so now they think that that's they, something they can get away with. And unfortunately, we, we, let them, we let them get away with it. And they're probably going to get away with it again. Yeah. So, yeah. So it'll be interesting to, I mean, I have very strong opinions about what we need to do going forward in terms of, you know, now's the time when we have to double down on the rest of Europe. Because at the end of the day, we should have never pushed this far east, right? And then with, at the, well, at the same time, removing so many forces from Europe. And the other issue is doubling down in Europe takes us up, takes our eye off the main ball, which is China, right? We've been doing a strategic, um, you know, transatlantic shift or not tra trans-Pacific shift toward, you know, China. And even they, they've been doing things that, um, you know, with a kind of island bases in the South China Sea. Uh, again, uh, in the interview, interview with Sean McFaith, admirals have told him privately, U.S. admirals, that they could wipe out those islands in an afternoon if they got the clearance. But we just, we don't have, we don't have the will to do any of this stuff. So in this sort of gray zone war warfare, the, like these dictators push and push as far as they can, um, you know, just to the line, but never over. And I, I, I just, I think the latest generation of political leadership in the, in the United States is among the most incompetent I've ever seen in my lifetime. And I'm like, and, and I'm not, I'm not talking, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not singling out Biden or Trump. Right. I would put them both in that category completely. Like just, they, they have the most most lethal military on the planet and they just they can't get out of their own way so anyway i, I you got me into a rant i don't know how you did it eric <laughs> i don't know but it's a good job good job all right well it was a pleasure having you and um if, if 
before we go, any, anything you're working on that people should know about that you know they should check out um, when it's ready? Yeah, just, just uh, you know, my uh, serialized novel, Air of the Line, on Kindle Bella. Um, that's that's my current project. I've got uh, another story coming out in analog science fiction soon. I just got the galleys for it. Um, Congrats. And another one coming out in daily science fiction soon. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I look forward to reading some of those, some of those books. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye.